to answer the questions that I keep getting about how should a poem look? How should it feel? How should it sound? How long should it be? How much punctuation should I use? I've tried to make this short video, which I'm going to call lines, stanzas, and syllables. How to get a handle on the structure, minutia of poetry. So first of all, how many lines should it be? Well, because I'm your audience, I really need to see you work. So I'm going to suggest that you should write anywhere between 12 and 40 lines. Should be enough to show that you have intention in the organization of your poem. It also should be enough to show that you have structure and pattern or shape in your poem. It should definitely be enough to say what you want to say. And it should be enough to capture the narrator's voice. Remember that in poetry, in a lot of writing actually, the author is not always the same as the narrator. Definitely stop writing your poem before you stop caring how it's structured. And definitely stop writing your poem and go even smaller if you can. Be even more concise. In poetry, because every syllable counts, you might want to make it quite concise. I want to give you an example of a poem by Ezra Pound, who was a famous poet for making these two-line poems called couplets. This poem's called In a Station of the Metro. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. That's the whole poem. Let's count the syllables in each line. The apparition of these faces in the crowd. That's 12 syllables. Can you do the second line on your own? Petals on a wet black bow. You should have counted 12 syllables in the first line and seven syllables in the second line. And you might have noticed he's using another technique here called alliteration. It was that even in just 19 syllables, he's able to still put in this word technique, this playful word technique of making two b sounds next to each other. Black bow. So why is there also a semicolon and a comma and a period? Well, if you look at that semicolon, for me, it really describes the two different spaces between an apparition of faces in the crowd, which is to me looking at all the passengers waiting to get on a subway, or the second line where he sees those faces now as petals on a wet black tree bough. Why then the comma between wet and black? Well, this is a formal and traditional way to use a comma because he's separating two adjectives, wet and black, from the word bow. Then why is there a period at the end? Well, the period is the conclusion. It tells us the poem is done and it leaves the image in our minds. How many syllables should be per line then? Well, anywhere between one and you have to decide the answer to that question. But when you're trying to make those choices, I want you to consider that each syllable has the possibility has the potential to be emphatic, to emphasize whatever it is that you're trying to emphasize. So notice that each syllable makes a sound. So carefully construct the noises for flow, like music. Sometimes you want staccato. Sometimes you want a pop. Say your poem out loud. Consider using a pattern of syllables per line. Let's look at Ode to a Corset, another example, so you can see where we've got some different sounds happening. This poem is called a concrete poem, and it's because the shape of the words imitates the subject. Do you see the image and the layout of these words? Do you see a slender neck? Do you see a waist? Let's read it together to answer the last question. A slender neck, soft, milky, shoulders perch proudly 
upon voluptuous, bulging bosoms, rising and falling, heaving and sighing, enchanting, enticing, overabundantly, overspilling, unforgiving, cutiel, boning, and lace, delicate ladies swoon and faint, their miniature waists so daintily encased. Winch, cinch, pinch, captured curves of rounded hips, bulge and beckon, dip and dance, imaginations fly and minds untie. There's that ellipsis at the end again. Hmm, makes me wonder. Makes me wonder if the imagination has taken over and there's no need for poetry anymore. Mm -hmm. So which of these words sound like what they represent? If you said the word skin, you would notice that the s sound is represented. Slender, soft, shoulders, spilling. You might also notice some other word sounds perch proudly, bulging, bosoms, swoon. And then there's this beautiful rhyme that happens. Faint, wastes, and cased. It's not a precise consonant rhyme, is it? It's a vowel rhyme. That's called assonance. Well, that's coming up. Captured curves, bulge, beckon, dip, dance, lots and lots of sounds. So in this case, it's not so much about the punctuation. It's about those sounds being the punctuation. There's still commas, there's still periods. But overall, the lines and the stanzas are designed to keep that shape in our minds. So we've got sound words in onomatopoeia, winch, cinch, pinch. And I wanted to point out that cutile and boning and lace are words, are diction that are so precise to the vocabulary of this subject, which is clothing, that it's called jargon now. How many lines per stanza? You know what I'm going to say now, don't you? Anywhere between one and it's up to you. But while you're making those decisions, consider that each stanza has the potential to show that time or place is different or has changed. Consider that each stanza could be telling part of a story. Consider that the space between the stanzas is also part of the story, that the imagination has to write since the poet left a space. Consider that there is the potential to make your poem look beautiful or ugly. Make sure that your poem's construction has meaning and that you have intentionally made it sound or look or feel a certain way. In this poem called Ghosts, Homage to Burial by Emily Berry, at first glance it looks like a paragraph until you read it. You can invest everything in someone, this one feeling chopping you up. Anyone can go into the night. I just want to be gone. I want to be unknown. There's a storm coming. Euphoria trapped in a vial. I was once in these mountains, the middle of nowhere. I used to get taken away. A lot of things were wrong. Cold things. Bad things. The weight of the decisions in you. You'd see these fires, someone upset on the other side of the world. It's like a Ouija board. It's the devil's face in their eyes, that feeling like a ghost touched you, like finding a body in a lift shaft on the other side of the night. Even if you fight to see it, you'll never see anything. I love rain, safe haven. Deserts, forests, people. I just want to be a symbol you alone could hear. Someone in your head. Everyone knows those sorts of feelings. When there's nowhere to go, 
tearing through an empty building the image of where you just were still on your retina. If you talk about it, it just sort of disappears. Who is you in this poem? Who is I in this poem? Who sees the storm? Is it the narrator, the I, or is it the you character? I also noticed that this poet uses ellipsis twice. Hmm, what does it all mean? Adding punctuation or not. Consider that punctuation in poetry is like breath. So when you speak it out loud, a piece of punctuation indicates a pause. Consider also that punctuation can continue or stop the rhythm that you are trying to create. Consider that punctuation can go with the conventions of the English language, or it can break every rule, but it is intentional. So let's look at one more sample together. E.E. E. Cummings is somebody who I think pretty much breaks all of the rules, and yet does it with such intention. Looking at this poem, spring is like a perhaps hand. Why is there a Roman numeral three at the top? Why three? Why not one? Does it mean maybe something like we're already jumping into the middle of an action or a narrative? Why, when we look at this poem, does he capitalize some things and not others? Why are there brackets? Why are the stanzas that end in the middle of a contraction? Let's try to answer the last question about the meaning of this poem after we read it together. Spring is like a perhaps hand. Three. Spring is like a perhaps hand, which comes carefully out of nowhere, arranging a window into which people look, while people stare, arranging and changing, placing carefully their a strange thing and a known thing here, and changing everything carefully. Spring is like a perhaps hand in a window, carefully to and fro, moving new and old things, while people stare carefully, moving a perhaps fraction of flower here, placing an inch of air there. And without breaking anything. What does spring mean to you? Spring for me really goes perfectly with this poem, actually, because it reminds me of the fact that I planted tulip bulbs in one place last year, and they seem to pop up in places where I didn't put them. And yet, even though it's slightly annoying that things are here and there, it's all perfect. It's not broken at all. Do you agree with E.E. E. Cummings that that's what spring is like? The playfulness of the arrangement and the punctuation breaks the rules, but every choice is intentional. And overall, it is like a piece of art. Every poem is, and that the viewer can decide what meaning the poet was trying to convey. The trick is that as the poet, you have to decide what that meaning is going to be.